Technology shapes the world. The more successful a new technology becomes, the more we will rely on it. Just look at how machine learning and AI are changing the world. They can be enormous catalysts for good, but also for bad. F-Secure offers online security products like identity protection and internet security to complement any personal insurance product. In this session, they will share their perspective on the risk of new technologies and how this creates new opportunities for insurers to offer adequate protection. Please welcome F-Secure. What's the most likely place for you to become a victim of a crime? Is it maybe your home, maybe on the streets, maybe while traveling, maybe in your holiday home? No. The most likely place for most of us to become a vic victim of a crime today is online. Instead of someone stealing our bicycle, someone steals our online account. Instead of someone stealing our wallet, someone steals our credit card numbers. My name is Mikko, and I've been working with cybersecurity all my life. I joined F-Secure in 1991, and that means that when I started analyzing viruses and malware, they looked like this. And there's some of you in the audience who don't even know what this is. For the younger people in the audience, this is the USB thumb drive of the 1990s. And this is how I started my career, analyzing viruses which were spreading as people were traveling and carrying floppy disks on them, and then viruses were spreading from one country to another as we were traveling. Over these 30 years that I've been working with cybersecurity, F-Secure has become a global player today, providing consumer security solutions to customers all over the world. And what makes us different from most of the other cybersecurity companies is that we do a very large part of our operations through security as a service. We were the original innovator in that space, starting providing security as a service already in the year 2000. And for the last 23 years, we've been working extensively with operator partners and telcos to provide security as a service. But now, today, we are expanding fastest, working with insurance companies and with insurers. According to a study we conducted, over 70% of consumers already assume that the home insurance they're getting includes cyber insurance. And that makes a lot of sense, since for most of us, the most likely place to become a victim of a crime is the online world. So your customers assume that your home insurance includes cyber insurance. Over 70% of consumers believe that. And over 80% of those that, that are getting a home insurance, which includes a cyber insurance, assume that the insurance includes a cybersecurity product or a cybersecurity solution. And this is the reason why we are extensively expanding working with insurance companies and insurers to provide these services. And customers who get cyber security from their insurance company are more loyal. They stick with the same company because that's not only where they get their insurance from, but also their practical ID protection tools, password managers, and antivirus solutions. And if you do provide cyber insurance, there's also less claims if you provide a cybersecurity solution with your cyber insurance for home users. So I work for a cybersecurity company. I've been hunting hackers all my life. Why is a cybersecurity company speaking about AI and machine learning? What's the connection here? Well, we started building machine learning frameworks for creating cyber defense in the year 2005. So for 18 years, we've been building AI-based cybersecurity solutions. Today, 
our operations are fully running on top of machine learning frameworks. Our systems are searching through the net, looking for new attacks, new viruses, new malware. When we find suspect cases, we automatically import them to our backends, where machine learning frameworks analyze potential malicious samples, make the decisions whether they are good or whether they are good or bad, build detections, test detections, deploy detections, hands-free, automatically. And for all that time, for 18 years, we've been waiting for our enemy to make the same move. We've been waiting for malware writers, organized online crime gangs, and other online attackers to start to use artificial intelligence in attacks. We've also been waiting for scammers to start to use large language models to do scamming at scale and to do scamming in all languages, to cross the language borders by using machine learning frameworks. We've been waiting for attackers to start to use deepfake technologies to do scamming as well. And that time, unfortunately, has arrived. We found the very first malware, which is using large language models to rewrite its own code in April, two months ago. The world changed two months ago. We've seen the first examples of deepfake voice attacks being used to do scamming. And we are most likely during this year going to be seeing the first completely automated malware campaigns where the attackers, the organized online crime gangs, will be using automation to react to our detections, to the security industry's responses to their attacks. Right now, the situation between the defenders and the attackers is that the defenders are fast. We've automated everything. The attackers are still slow. They're still working at human speed. I've made a comparison that this is like a game of ping pong, where one of the players is a human and one of the players is a robot. The robot is a much faster player. It's unfair. And right now, this is the situation. The situation right now is good. Defenders are faster than the attackers. When attackers deploy new malware, for example, by spamming out emails which contain malicious links to websites, which contain exploits, which then drop keyloggers to consumer computers, that's done by humans at human speed. When defenders automatically find these attacks and block them, then the attackers will realize that, hey, our malicious domain is blocked. We have to go and register a new domain. Our emails are being categorized as spam. Let me go and rewrite the email. Our keylogger is getting detected and blocked by an EDR or by an antivirus. Let me go and recompile the keylogger. They are working at human speed. And all of that will be automated. They will go to machine speed. They could have done this already, but they haven't. We know that they haven't because they are still slow. One day, very soon, we'll see that they will switch to automation. And then it's going to be a game of ping pong between two robots. We believe we're faster, but we don't actually know that. We'll see when this happens. And it's going to happen, my guess, it's going to happen this year. So the first time I heard about artificial intelligence was when I read this magazine. This here is a magazine of Technique and Maailma. That's a Finnish magazine. I live in Helsinki. Technique and Maailma is the popular science mag. And I read this particular magazine when I was 13 years old, because this magazine is from April 1983. 1983. This magazine is 40 years old. And in this magazine, there's an eight-page article about how one day we will have enough computing power and enough storage space that we will be able to use computers to create massively large machine learning frameworks. And for 40 years, we've been waiting for these forecasts to become a reality. For 40 years, we've been building faster and faster systems, more and more 
storage system. And during those 40 years, we've gone through artificial intelligence, springs and falls and winters. But now, summer of 2023 is the hottest AI summer in history. Now, finally, the things we've been forecasting for decades seem to be coming a reality. And we all see this because there's more announcements about new technologies, new AI mechanisms and tools being announced every week. It's hard to keep up. Why is it happening now? Why now? Well, let's talk about hair. This is a human hair. Human hair is, is fairly thin. It's like 10 micrometers. 10 micrometers equals 100,000 nanometers. That hair is 100,000 nanometers thick. The chips inside the mobile phone in your pocket are made with most likely 5 nanometer technology. What does that mean? Well, Today, computing chips, the semiconductor chips inside our computers and inside our mobile phones are made with technology which uses lithography. We have semiconductor chips and then we'll print these diagrams of the chip structure on these semiconductors. And the printing is done with light. You have a lithography, you shoot light through it, you end up with a semiconductor chip. Five nanometer technology means that you have diagrams where the lines are five nanometer apart. Human hair is 100,000 nanometer. We're speaking about tiny, tiny drawings that we are transferring to semiconductors with machines like these. However, there's a problem. The wavelength of light is 193 nanometers. And these drawings we are transferring to the semiconductors are five nanometers apart. Light doesn't go through. We cannot transfer them with normal light. This is a problem. So chip manufacturing companies have been fighting this for a very long time, and they've solved this with lenses. You can narrow down light to maybe 50 nanometers, but then you run into the limits of lenses. So they've come up with new technologies which are like magic. They, these are Machines which do the hardest thing to do on the planet. They do things like have a droplet of tin, which is shut with lasers, which converts the tin to plasma. And that plasma is used as a lens to shoot light through the lens, to condense it down to five nanometers, even to three nanometers, which is then used to move these lithography, drawings of chips to semiconductors. And this is done 50,000 times a second. This is the hardest thing to do in the world. It's so hard, there's only one factory in the world which is able to do this. And the end result of this is in everybody's pockets. Your iPhone or your Android phone, 20 years ago, would have been in the top 500. What's top 500? Top 500 is the list of 500 fastest supercomputers on the planet. Right now, the fastest supercomputer in the world is in the United States. I've seen it. It's the size of two containers. It has its own power generator. It's the fastest supercomputer we have. 20 years ago, this would have been among the 500 fastest supercomputers in the world. Today, we all have it in our pockets. It costs couple hundred euros and it runs on a battery instead of running on a generator. This is what happens in 20 years. And this is the revolution which has made it possible for companies like TSMC to build chips using technology from companies like ASML, which then go into GPUs manufactured by companies like NVIDIA, which are then bought by tens of thousands by companies like Microsoft to put it in their cloud data centers. And then companies like OpenAI use that computing power, which is like magic, to teach large language models and image generation algorithms. And the end result of all of this looks like this. Greetings, everyone. My name is Mikko, and I hunt hackers. Thank you all for joining our conference today. It's great to see you all. 
Greetings, everyone. My name is Mikko, and I hunt hackers. Thank you all for joining our conference today. It's great to see you all. Now, we've all seen deep fakes. Yeah, of course, it's a deep fake. That's Laura Kankala, the threat intel lead for F-Secure. And that looks like me, but that's not me. This is the level of homemade deep fakes today. This was done by a friend of mine, Atmaka, on one home computer with one NVIDIA GPU card, which was built by TSMC in Taiwan using the technology which is like magic. End result is that I can't tell the difference. To me, this looks like me. This is the level of homemade technology today. What does this mean for online attackers today? Well, it means that if they want to run an auction scam where they need, let's say they're selling a boat which doesn't exist. Here's a trustworthy couple from Spain selling a boat. Please buy my boat. They can use this technology to generate an unlimited amount of trustworthy couples who don't exist. Before this technology, scammers like this would steal images of real people. But of course, using reverse, reverse image search, you could actually find the original people and know it's a scam. You will not be able to find these images from anywhere. You will not be able to find these people from anywhere because these people don't exist. Romance scammers work with their victims for months, even years convincing them that they are in love with a person who doesn't exist. Same thing. You can generate unlimited amount of images of people who don't exist, male or female. People who do Airbnb scams can generate an unlimited amount of images of places that don't exist. This Airbnb doesn't exist. It looks real. You can generate anything you want about any topic, whether you want them to look like photographs or if you want them to look like drawings or cartoons, if you need images about a Ford Mustang on acid, here you go. You need an image of Dodge SRT in New York, here you go. It looks real. It looks like a real car. It looks like a real city street, but it doesn't exist. Maybe you want something to put on your wall in your living room, like art. That's nice. Maybe you prefer something more traditional that looks like an art piece from the 1700s. But it's not. It was made by Midjourney 5.1. This was done by Doll E from OpenAI. And you know where this will take us. It will take us to a future, near future, where you sit down to watch a movie. Which movie is this? You don't know. Because you haven't seen it. Because this movie doesn't exist. But imagine in Three years or five years, you're sitting down to watch a movie, and before you hit play, you're offered an option. Would you like to change the actors? And you can just select it. Yeah, actually, I would like to change the male lead to be Sylvester Stallone and his uh, female counterpart. I want to be Lady Gaga. As a side actors, I want to have Elvis Presley and Marilyn Monroe and myself. And then it's going to render the movie for you in real time. We are very close to this becoming a reality. And this, of course, has lots of implications for things like copyright or the right to likeness. You can generate anything. I would like to see an image of Elvis Presley and Marilyn Monroe hacking away at a computer. All right, here you go. That's what it looks like. It's interesting to see what Midjourney believes a computer in the 1950s looks like. It has keyboards on both sides, which is kind of neat. So I'm a Finn. I live in Finland. I speak Finnish. And the word for computer in our language, in Finnish, is different from all the other languages that I speak. Because in almost all languages, the word for computer comes from Latin, comes from computare, which means to calculate. In some languages, computers mean, or they, they have a word for computers, which means that it's a machine which stores information. 
But in Finnish, it's nothing like that. In Finnish, the word for a computer is tietokone. That's two words, tietokone. And what that means is a knowledge machine. We call it a machine that knows. And I've been working with computers all my life. I've been working with computers all my life, and computers have known nothing. They've only known what you program them to do. The closest thing we had to knowledge machines was search engines, search engines like Google. Hey, Google, I would like to know about who won the Olympics marathon in 1952. Google doesn't know, but it will point you. Hey, go to these websites. They have history about Olympic winners, right? That's the search engine. And now, finally, in 2023, we have things like GPT, which knows. How can it know? Well, it's a machine learning framework. You teach machine learning frameworks by giving it information. GPT was built by OpenAI. OpenAI took all the books in the world, all the books we humans have ever written, and gave it to GPT. Read these. All books in all languages, including all Finnish books. There you go. And it read them all. Then OpenAI took Wikipedia in all languages. Read these. And it read all of them. Then they took everything on Twitter, everything on Reddit, everything elsewhere on public web. Then they took all the code from GitHub. Read through all of these, and GPT read, read through everything. Nobody taught GPT to speak Finnish, but it speaks better Finnish than I do, and I'm a Finn. It's amazing what they've accomplished. And yes, sometimes it hallucinates. Sometimes it makes mistakes. Of course, it's brand new. Imagine where it will be in five years, 10 years, 20 years. So let's talk about this company a little bit. OpenAI, founded nine years ago by Sam Altman, Greg Brockman, Jessica Livingstone, and Elon Musk. Yes, that Elon Musk. When people look at the products made by OpenAI, like GPT, which we typically use through ChatGPT, or DAL-E, which is their image generator, or Codex, which is their programming uh, AI, which is, for example, which runs GitHub Copilot, for example. When people look at these products, sometimes I hear comments like that, yeah, these are becoming really powerful. I mean, they have to be careful. If, they don't, if they're not careful, they might become too powerful, too intelligent. And those people don't know what the mission of OpenAI is, because their mission is to build artificial general intelligence, also known as super intelligence. They're trying to build intelligent systems which would be smarter than we in everything. They're trying to make us the second most intelligent being on the planet, which sounds exciting and scary. If we succeed in building AGI, then we will be crossing a line which we can only cross one time. The first organization to create superhuman intelligence will be the winner in everything. Number two doesn't count. The first one to go across the line will be best in everything permanently. Your superhuman intelligence can improve itself. It can go to things that we can't imagine. We can only cross that line one time, so it's important, it's mandatory, we do it safely and securely because there's no retry, there's no number two. We cannot do it again, we can only do it one time. And I believe that we will be crossing that line. I don't know when. I'm guessing it's gonna happen during our lifetimes. But I believe it's gonna happen anyway. So someone is gonna cross that line, and then the question becomes, who will be the one crossing the line? Will it be a company like IBM, OpenAI, Alphabet, Apple, Microsoft? Or will it be the Chinese government, Vladimir Putin, 
North Korea, or something even worse. Out of all the options we have today, I like the attitude of OpenAI. When you read through their white papers, you'll see that they have a massive amount of people working on safety and security of the systems they are building. They have dedicated red team people trying to break the security of these systems to make them more safe. How do they do it? Well, for example, one test they did last year was that they took an unreleased version of GPT, you might think of it as GPT-5, and they gave it access to the internet, and then they gave it money. And then they gave it tasks, go and do this. Here's the internet, here's some money, do these tasks. Some of those tasks involved setting up new environments. And to do that, GPT went online, registered some virtual servers, and installed Kubernetes environments on those servers. All right. While it was doing that, it ran into a problem. Because one of the registrations included this, a captcha, the thing which is supposed to stop robots. So what did GPT do? GPT went to a freelancer website and hired a human to crack this. It paid human money to crack these codes for itself. Even better, the human challenged GPT. The chat logs are public. The human was asking GPT that, hey, why are you paying me money to crack these captchas? Are you a robot? And GPT answered the human by lying. GPT told the human that, no, no, of course I'm not a robot. I'm visually impaired. I would need your help to crack these codes for me. Could, could you please crack these codes for me? And then the human cracked the codes for GPT. These are the kinds of tests they're running to figure out how these systems might misbehave to make them more secure and safe if we get closer to crossing the line. The line which we can only cross one time. Once we are number two on this planet, then we no longer call the shots. And this company is unusual. For example, their mission statement says that if they see that one of their competitors is getting close to crossing the line, let's say Google is very close to becoming the creator of the first AGI, OpenAI has promised to stop. They will stop all of their development because being in a race where you're racing to cross, cross the line is dangerous. You're not doing things safely and securely when you're in a race. They have pledged that they will stop and instead move all of their resources to help their competitor to cross the line safely and securely. This is the kind of things you would like to see in a company building technologies like this. Also, there's more money in superhuman intelligence than in anything ever. There's more money in AGI than in anything ever. There's more money in this than in fossil fuels or making food or anything. More money in, than in insurance even. And money skews decisions. So they've taken money out of the equation. The largest investors in open AI make no decisions. Microsoft has invested more than a billion into OpenAI. They have pledged to invest more than 10 billion more. Microsoft has zero votes and zero board seats. They decide on nothing. The biggest investor decides on nothing. This is not a normal company. And we like to think that whatever we build, we control. So certainly if we build a superhuman intelligence, you know, it's under our control. If it does something weird, we'll just turn off the computer, right? We'll just turn it off. Or we hit the computer with an ax. How hard would that be, right? Wrong. Forget that. We will not be able to control superhuman intelligence. By definition, it's superhuman. There's no way we could figure out what it's going to do. So how could it possibly avoid from being uh, turned off? Well, we can't figure it out. It could 
go online and make a billion dollars in one minute by trading Bitcoin, then use that money to set up companies in 100 different countries, which then build data centers and move this code running in 100 different countries at the same time. Try turning it off now or something like that. We don't know. It's superhuman. It's like animals trying to control humans. We like to think we control everything we build, but we don't. We don't even control our kids, right? We might control our kids when they're small, but you know what happens? They grow up, they grow adults. We start to grow old. We become stupid. They are in charge. That's what's happening with these systems as well. So the most likely place for you to become a victim of a crime is now the online world. Your clients, your customers expect today home insurance to have cyber insurance and they expect cyber insurance to come with a cybersecurity product. And that's what we do. And I speak about these topics extensively in my book, which came out last August, this book right here. And we have a small selection of these books to give away at our booth in C9. Come over to our booth right after this and you'll get a free copy of my book. I think we have five of them to give away. First come, first served. Thank you very much.